but it's an absolute pleasure to work with him and everybody else at the Science of the Human Past, and it's been a great experience uh, doing multidisciplinary research, particularly over the range that we're doing from physical science to history is an amazing treat. And most of us who are in physical science fields similar to mine, we're interested in the past. So it's a great opportunity to, to share this together. One second. Thank you. Excuse me. So my job uh, in my short presentation today is really to just introduce you to ice cores. You're going to hear a lot more primarily from Heather Clifford uh, and from others and the application. Great, thank you. Ice cores are these uh, rather, I remember 30 years ago, I couldn't pay people to talk about ice cores. <laughs> now, it's, now it's more interesting. Uh, cylinders of ice, uh, which we carefully collect. They have very low concentrations of a variety of things in them, hence the, the clean suit. Uh, and you can do an awful lot with ice cores. Uh, you can reconstruct past temperature, precipitation, atmospheric circulation patterns, sea ice extent, forest fires, volcanoes, meteorite impacts, and just goes on and on. They're very, they're extremely robust uh, tools. Uh, ba buried meteorological stations, buried atmospheric chemistry stations. We've worked all over the world. Uh, these are just sort of very generalized areas on every continent. Uh, collecting ice cores that go back in one case and under Kopertov's case go back uh, in excess of a million years. Uh, the thing that we've done that's probably sets us apart probably from some other groups is that we've actually focused primarily on the chemistry in ice cores and we use this ice core chemistry as a mechanism or tool by which we can fingerprint uh, air masses. This is a, uh, a, na live uh, a NASA imagery which has been colorized and has been colorized to show you that the dominant chemistry in the Southern Ocean is this light Blue, which is sea salt, dominant chemistry. Green is related to biomass burning. Uh, dusts coming off the Sahara and making their way all the way across, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we care about atmospheric uh, circulation? Uh, because we can track air masses. We know where they come from. We can tell how their source has changed, whether that is natural or anthropogenic in, for example, the case of lead. Uh, the atmosphere is critically important because it transports heat, uh, moisture, pollutants all over. Uh, obviously, the atmosphere has a, is coupled to the surface of the ocean and impacts uh, the surface of the ocean where, where waves are. And they, if you look at atmospheric circulation back through time, and I'll show you very briefly, you can identify the fact that there are, have been in the past, despite what we thought prior to this, uh, prior to 20 years ago, that the climate does not necessarily operate in a very slow, linear way. It can change very quickly. So we, uh, we recover these ice cores from all over the world. Uh, we were uh, heavily involved in the discovery of abrupt climate change. I'll show you a bit more. Acid rain, uh, lead, which we'll talk about today. Uh, discovered a 10 to 100 times increase in the levels of uranium on the Antarctic Peninsula in the last 35 years as a consequence of open pit mining in Australia. We were the first to identify uh, Chernobyl in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we've worked on the Antarctic ozone hole, showing that the current size is very large, uh, well beyond anything expected in the natural. Uh, we've worked on various water resource issues, Arctic warming, disruption to past civilizations, Bottom line is you can do tons with these ice cores. And one of the things that you can do, uh, it, ice cores always tell the truth. Uh, so you can't hide. Uh, and if you take a look at ice cores that come from Mount Logan, which monitors Chinese air, that come uh, ice cores in Greenland, which monitor air that comes from North America and to some degree Europe, and ice cores from uh, Europe, what you find in the case of lead is a rather dramatic rise at the beginning of the 1900s in most of them, then a very dramatic rise as, in, as uh, obviously the use of lead uh, increases dramatically, primarily due to lead of fuels and other things, and then you find a very sharp drop. You see the, the rise being very prominent in, the, in uh, North America off the Greenland record and the Clean Air Act function working. You see, uh, although a lower resolution, the same thing happening in Europe, 
uh, although the drop comes a little bit later because they had the Clean Air Act later. And in Canada, uh, where we were monitoring Chinese air, amongst other things, you see that the rise continues. And then our record, which ends at about 2000, uh, was before they began to legislate to some degree. So what can you do better uh, than understanding how lead has changed uh, working on water resources, well, you can get down into super detail in places where either the ice is very thin or the snow is very thin as it accumulates or where it's heavily or significantly compressed. And we have been able, uh, with the Cole Nefetti record, with this new technology that we've developed, uh, to basically change what is normally about 100 samples per meter that you can take and do many measurements on. We've been able to change that to in excess of 10,000 measurements per meter. So it now means that instead of looking at years, possibly seasons, but more likely multi-years and decades, we can look as long ago as 85,000 years ago and still have two to 300 samples per year. So we can look at, at storm events. I won't bore you with all of the details about the instrumentation. Uh, so the place that we use this first, because we've been very interested and we've done a lot of work in the Greenland Ice Core, uh, was to actually go through and redo parts of the Greenland Ice Core. This is the uh, longest, most detailed record ever produced from the Northern Hemisphere. It goes back about 110,000 years. It completely changed the way we think about climate change in the following way, because we found these abrupt climate change events. And as opposed to uh, assuming in the past that climate operated very, very slowly, the one I'll focus on very, very quickly is this one. This is this little period of cooling. And in this plot, increased dustiness at the end of the Ice Age. It ended about 11,500 years ago. It was called the Younger Dryas. And the transition between that last pulse of cold, uh, dusty conditions into modern climate uh, happened very fast. Uh, and all of this was based on a little bit more than 16,000 samples in 110,000 years. To discover that, we actually did 10 centimeter sampling, and yet that was still enough to, uh, to discover this thing. So what can you do better? Well, what you can do better is ideally to get several hundred samples per meter. And we looked at the transition from the last vestiges of the last ice age into modern climate. And this happens literally in one to two years. There's the last four years of the, la of the last ice age. Here's the first two years of modern climate. And what you find out at that transition 11,500 years ago, the length of the summer doubled. And without going into detail, we know that the low levels are summer. The high levels in this chemistry happen to be a winter spring. That's very fast, and it's a very big change. Why does that matter? It matters because if you take a look at uh, the warming in the Arctic, which we all know is changing dramatically, you look at the Eastern Arctic, where the warming has been most intense, in fact, the temperature change, mean annual temperature change in five years is on the order of about five degrees centigrade. If you translate that into the amount of melting, it turns out that, that we have experienced in the last few years a doubling in the length of the summer, certainly in parts of the Arctic. This is the very first abrupt climate change of the modern era. And that tells us that we should not expect just simple linear changes in the future, but we should expect uh, surprises. So as of 2013, uh, we all got together, recovered uh, this amazing ice core uh, from Col Nefeti. This is the team over here. And I'll turn it over to Heather, who will give you the real information. <laughs> 